Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back for those uh, who are part of uh, uh, Youth in High Dimensions, and welcome to the others for this uh, very special lecture from Michael Douglas, uh, who is part of the Center uh, for Mathematical Sciences and Applications in Harvard and uh, Stony Brook University. Michael is a uh, originally string theorist, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, after uh, some time, he got very much interested into machine learning, which is, I think, uh, right on the spot for the, the topic of the present SMR, so we thought it could be nice to, to combine. And so um, Michael will approach, I think, a pretty timely question, which is how will we do mathematics in 2030? So, so I'm very keen to hear about that. Thank you, Michael, for being here, and uh, please, uh, we can start. Okay, thanks, John. Th thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to uh, join you at this uh, exciting conference, and always a pleasure to visit the ICTP. So I'll be uh, speaking about uh, the title and the overview of uh, mostly uh, ways that uh, you know, <coughs> computers are, have and, and will change the way we uh, do not just mathematics, but the mathematical sciences. I've been giving this talk since uh, late uh, 2019, and uh, it's evolved. And in fact, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's clear that progress has become very much, uh, it has accelerated. Things have gone faster than what I predicted. But I, so I've changed the talk a little bit since the beginning, but uh, pretty much what I said uh, has held up. So uh, I'm going to really start by giving a, a lightning sort of a history of uh, computer science, because uh, to uh, understand the developments, I think you have to put it in some perspective and uh, then uh, extrapolate uh, from that and, of course, from the, all the uh, amazing progress that's uh, going on now. So uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, uh, well, I mean, the history of uh, computer science, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there were earlier ideas, but the uh, real history begins just before and uh, during and after World War II, and in particular, the first electronic uh, computers, which uh, were very specialized devices. You know, people wanted to... Uh, simulate, people wanted to uh, calculate trajectories and uh, design atom bombs and such. But uh, you know, very quickly, you know, the pioneers of computer science saw that these were much more general devices. And you could imagine doing all sorts of things and understanding many subjects in a new way. And uh, so a lot of what uh, we have today is, is, is built on these original insights, uh, this idea of a uh, worldwide uh, database that would connect everybody to uh, the store of knowledge goes back to uh, you know, the 40s and 50s, uh, Van Avar Bush. Uh, this broad subject sometimes called uh, cybernetics, uh, control systems. It has ma many, many names uh, started then, trying to control systems uh, using the ability to feedback and uh, not just uh, have simple feedback systems. The, the, the concepts of artificial intelligence was a famous meeting in uh, 1956 where that term was uh, proposed, and uh, I'll get into that. A, a, a term that's uh, less used today and kind of brings together a lot of ideas of uh, computing that are based on phenomena in uh, other areas of uh, science. So Rosenblatt, uh, famously, the the, who proposed the uh, perceptron model inspired by a neurons <coughs> of the human brain, uh, Willem and von Neumann and Sayo Automata. Holland was one of the earlier workers on the genetic algorithms. And uh, so, 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 so the, these founding ideas go way back. And uh, then, of course, uh, you know, computing very quickly, and I'll get into some examples of this, had an impact, the ability to do uh, simulation already had a, a strong impact. And uh, some of these early ideas of uh, artificial intelligence, in particular automated theorem proving, one of the first uh, projects of uh, Newell and Simon in artificial intelligence was a system they called a theorem prover that you know, would do what it said. And uh, 
not, it, it, didn't, it didn't take long to realize that uh, this, although as a you know, philosophical or even a, a question of mathematical logic, you could make an algorithm that could prove all, list all proofs and thus prove all provable statements. Uh, that's a algorithm that takes exponential time to find. You know, a proof of length L takes exponential of L time. And uh, one can try to uh, optimize that. That's a lot of the story of early AI is how do you search? You know, how do you search through a tree of moves of a game or steps in a proof? But uh, that was a difficulty that uh, took a long time to, uh, to make progress. And even you know, doubling your, the depth of the tree that you can search doesn't get you very far. But a lot of the, again, the ideas that we use now, you know, maxima, early symbolic manipulation systems, you know, th th those ideas go back to this time, this is the 60s now. Uh, okay, and then if we're going to make a you know, very broad history, and I'll point, point out what were like the most significant developments, I think the next that belongs in that foundational category is uh, the internet. And uh, that's hugely changed the way that uh, everybody you know, lives, but you know, in particular, the topic of this talk, how scientists and mathematicians do uh, research. And uh, the story I tell from my own experience to illustrate this is uh, string theory. You know, some of you, certainly ICTP is a very active place in, in string theory. And uh, the, uh, when I was a uh, grad student in studying string theory at uh, Caltech in the 80s, it was kind of a frustrating place to be. So it was this, what we now call the first super string revolution. And, uh, we, you know, it was very, very exciting, you know, on the manifolds and the heroic string. And uh, the grad students at uh, Caltech, where I was, you know, worked hard to keep up by reading preprints. You know, how did you find out what was the, the latest results in research? You would occasionally get this uh, box in the mail full of uh, printed out uh, papers, preprints. And uh, they would come from the different uh, institutes doing, universities doing work. So we would eagerly open these and uh, read the preprints and absorb ideas and come up with our own ideas and hypotheses and start working on it and make some progress. And, and, and then the next box would come. And our, our ideas would already have been uh, anticipated and we would see papers about it. And it was, it was, it was, it was frustrating. And uh, the progress was very much centered in uh, Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, to some extent, uh, a few other places, Harvard, but uh, not you know, very largely in, in one geographical area. Uh, and, and so that was the mid 80s. And then already in, in 1993, so, so the, uh, the archive started in uh, 1991. And uh, then uh, in 93, there was what we now call the, the second superstring revolution with uh, duality, uh, black hole state counting. Uh, eventually things like a gauge gravity duality. And uh, you know, this, this you really can point at the, the person who started it. It was uh, Ashok Sen working in India in 1993. And uh, then the subsequent development of that was very different than the way things had gone in the first superstring revolution because Sen stayed at the forefront and many people were at the forefront and the research was really dispersed around the uh, world. I remember in the... Uh, Mid 90s, uh, we, we, paper came out of uh, I think Czech, it was Czechoslovakia, you know, by some guy we'd never heard of, and uh, you know, said, well, "Oh, how did this guy really wrote a pretty good paper on you know exactly what's uh, the, you know the latest ideas." And it was a Lubush model, and you're know, working more or less alone. And uh, you know, again, many many stories of of people who could catch up and, and stay you know stay current with the the internet. So so very much changed the way that uh, people worked and uh, very much uh, broadened and democratized uh, you know, cutting edge research around the world. And uh, so we could you know, go through a lot of examples of you know, how does this kind of communication affect uh, research, you know, the way we discuss, the way we think. But I think uh, if you had to pick one, the one that uh, really not only was a great success, but surprised everybody. When it was started, people did not think it would work at all is uh, Wikipedia. You know, so, so again, I'm, I'm talking to you know, much of the audience, uh, Wikipedia, you know, when, you know, hard, hard to imagine that, that that didn't exist sometime. And uh, that was, of course, created, you know, begun in the early 2000s. 
And uh, then, you know, there was very, you know, quick, uh, you know, expectation that, no, this thing's just going to break down. You know, if, if you let everybody edit an article, then uh, how can it ever maintain any standard of quality? You know, doesn't somebody have to look it over and supervise? And, and of course, somebody does have to look it over and supervise. You know, there are uh, chief editors in Wikipedia and a kind of a hierarchy and discussion, but uh, it requires much less work than the uh, previous method, and it, it, it kind of works. You know, I, again, I, I wouldn't necessarily trust Wikipedia, although it's much more trustworthy than ChatGPT, you must say. But uh, you know, still, as, as, a, as a starting point for uh, understanding something new, this is, this is really the best that we have at the moment. OK, so, so now we're in this uh, third uh, technological leap of uh, machine learning. And uh, you know, again, I think that uh, since uh, 2012, everybody would <coughs> agree this is uh, of equal importance to uh, these uh, previous uh, steps forward. And uh, you know, since uh, the talk, uh, since I started giving the talk, that was a period when uh, Google and uh, the others were hiring thousands of, you know, you know, professional you know, PhDs of all sorts, and, and physicists in, in particular, you know, mathematicians and so forth. Uh, now we've gone through a whole cycle of uh, hiring and uh, less hiring and, 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 and firing. But you know, the overall you know growth of you know the you know the, this this profession and this uh, style of work, the impact is, is you know continues to grow. And uh, so uh, you know, the central topic of, of this talk, you know, how do we do mathematics, how will we do mathematics, mathematical sciences, physics, and the rest in, in 2030, you know, the, the, the first thing we'll point out, of course, is, you know, how will these developments of machine learning and uh, AI change the way we do things, just as uh, these previous developments changed the way. Okay, so, so that's the uh, bit of history and setting. And uh, so now, you know, there's this, uh, Broad, broad area of, of, of computational mathematics, which is, is not new at all, and it certainly long predates uh, the electronic uh, computers. And uh, you know, the famous you know, Ramanuja, you know, we, we can point at as a you know, unbelievable you know, genius in, in coming up with uh, formulas by computation and by pure intuition. And of course, that's a uh, you know, very, very live and important tradition. And uh, Computers add to it, and uh, you, know, you can point at you know some subjects, certainly you know, specific results, but and then subjects in mathematics and physics that uh, really became possible because of computation. And I, I think what one, one could debate, but I think that the, the best example of this is uh, dynamical systems theory. You know, the defining concepts, are, of course, are very old, and people worked on you know the dynamics, celestial mechanics, the dynamics of the solar system centuries before, but it's just too hard, you know, there's really, you know, the, 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 the intricacy of non-integrable mechanical systems is just, you know, too much to do it all with pen and paper, and uh, a lot of the properties were, were discovered leading eventually, you know, to, 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 to conjectures, to rigorous results by computer simulation of uh, ODEs and PDs and the like, and, 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 and you know, many, many other areas of, of, of math, you know, discrete uh, subjects tend to be easier. A lot of the, if you look at the classification to the finite simple groups, uh, actually that was, the, the, the complicated ones such as the monster were very much uh, reliant on computer calculations to complete them. The uh, birch swinnerton dyer conjecture, I'll talk about a little bit more later, was based on calculations done in the uh, 50s and 60s by uh, its, its originators. Uh, the Simons collaboration on arithmetic geometry is a uh, you know, living you know, descendant of, 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 of this kind of project. And uh, so uh, that's an area of the mathematical sciences where we can try to make extrapolations for, for 2030. Well, clearly, the computers get faster, get cheaper, you know, even though the uh, you know, the, the original idea of Moore's law, well, even the original idea of Moore's law that the transistors get smaller has kept going up until more or less now. It's always, it's been, it's, it's, it's died, you know, like 15 times Moore's law, but now we're down to, uh, you know, like three nanometer features and uh, computer, you know, the, that, that has been used. So this idea that, com you know, even, and even if, you know, the, the actual components on a chip don't get smaller, 
the, the tools for packing more of them into one space and running things in parallel continually improve. So it's, it's again, a, a reasonable simplification of the situation. That's to say that every year, the available computation for any given uh, class of problems doubles. And so if we're within a factor of a 1,000 of computer time and resources to solve a problem now, then that problem will just be solved by doing what we're doing now with the factor of 1,000 better computers. So that's an easy prediction. OK, uh, I'll, I'll go through a few of these others. I'm going to go through this one very quickly, though, because it's, it's, it's interesting, but it uh, takes a little time. So. There are many, many techniques which are not machine learning. Maybe that's the main point that uh, this, this, this topic is going to illustrate, that are potentially, of, they're already of great value to, uh, you know, in the industry, you know, to researchers in many subjects. They can be applied to mathematical problems. And a good example of that is what's called the Boolean Pythagorean triple problem. Okay, so you take uh, the uh, positive integers, one up to some n, and the question is, can you color them, or equivalently divide them, you know, partition them into two subsets, such that no subset, neither subset contains a Pythagorean triple, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And uh, you know, it would be interesting, you know, it's interesting you could estimate you know, what's the uh, likely end for which this will fail. But then the intricacy of the solution is such that it's going to be very hard to come up with a, you know, even writing down the uh, coloring and verifying it for some valid n in the thousands is going to take quite a while. And uh, it was proven to be possible for n equals 7,824 and impossible for 7,825 by uh, Hoyle et al. in uh, 2016. And uh, how did they do that? So this is a problem that you can fairly directly encode into propositional logic. So you have n variables labeled you know, x1 through xn. And we'll say that if uh, you know, x1 is uh, false, then uh, 1 is colored red. If x1 is true, 1 is colored blue, and so, so on for the others. And then each Pythagorean triple turns into a, a logical clause, basically stating that for that triple, the three variables don't all take the uh, same values. That's straightforward. And then you can take this long system of you know, roughly a million clauses and feed it to what's called a SAT solver, a program which just looks for solutions of uh, systems of you know, Boolean equations. Or you know, the, the somewhat harder part can generate a, a proof, a certificate, that there is no solution. And these turn out to be very, very efficient so that one can do you know, this, this type of calculation in, in, a, in a day or two. You know, reasonable size computer, but uh, this is you know, people in industry deal with much bigger systems than this. And so this proof that it doesn't exist for this larger end is something like 200 terabytes long. So in the sense of uh, understanding, you know, why do we, uh, you know, you know, why, you know, again, in some rough sense, you, I think you could estimate that the end, you know, it'd be interesting yeah, to get an argument to, to, to get a, a good estimate without all that work. but. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's probably the understanding in, in, in this case. But then the details are, are intricate. And uh, then there, there are extensions of this that, that can be adapted to, to solve somewhat you know, more. They tend to like these sort of intricate problems, where it's what's called a SAT plus a CAS. And there's a group at Waterloo, in particular, that specializes in this, that uh, you combine the SAT solver with uh, symbolic algebra to generate the initial clauses based on whatever the equations or mathematical structure you start with. And so an example of a problem that they made progress on is this uh, so-called a Williamson conjecture. Can you find four symmetric n by n matrices, all of whose entries are plus or minus one, such that the sum of these four squared is proportional to the identity? And uh, the, they exist for any rank, any dimension up to 35, every even dimension up to 70, proven not to exist for 35. You know, why, why is that? Well, maybe there's some answer. Anyways, very interesting source of uh, results and uh, potential you know, conjectures. OK, so uh, machine learning, neural networks. You know, again, one could, in, in, in early versions of this talk, I kind of said you know, this is obviously important. But now I, I, I think one has to, to say more. This is a plot 
of you know year versus uh, log of uh, basically amount of training time put into you know say developing a model, writing a paper, and so forth. You know, so measured in some you know petaflops per you know you know times times days and petaflops per second times days. And uh, th this is the history of these machine learning problems. And the basic feature of this graph is this inflection point here in 2012. Okay, so this is when uh, the AlexNet, this, this great uh, you know, advance in computer vision was made. And ever since, people have been doubling the amount of computer time spent on machine learning every 3.4 months. And this went up to 2020, and I suspect that if you continued it, it would have a further increase right around uh, 2022. So due to the language models. Okay, so people here all know this. I mean, uh, this, this slide, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say it because not everybody's at the uh, conference. There's this kind of three standard paradigms of uh, machine learning that uh, you could be given a data set and the input might be the position in one of these uh, plots, you know, giving you know, two of the input features or variables. And then you might be uh, <clears throat> given a, a target to predict, such as blue versus green, supervised learning. You might not be given anything but the input, and you're trying to now either cluster or estimate a probability distribution, unsupervised learning. Or you could be in this somewhat different paradigm where there is something you're sort of trying to predict and optimize, but uh, you typically don't get, uh, you know, you, you get signals much later. For the, the classic example being you play a game, and at the end you find out you won or lost, but you have to somehow figure out which moves did I make led to winning and losing. And uh, so there are these three general paradigms, and they all have their applications. And uh, the slides are uh, made available afterwards. These are various uh, relevant uh, comments, which I think I will uh, skip in the interest of uh, time. And uh, then if you're applying this, well, again, there's many ways you can apply it. But if we're going to talk about uh, pure mathematics, theoretical physics, I think the, the primary application is actually to a synthetic data. You know, it's to say not, you know, obviously we're not, you know, building an apparatus and doing measurements. You know, if I'm an astrophysicist or an astronomer, of course, that is what I'm doing. But if I'm a number theorist, that's not what I'm doing. And you, and you might wonder. But, of course, there's a huge amount of data in my subject. And this is what uh, people like Gauss were filling up notebooks with. And that is the data that is this primary resource now for the computer to try to look for patterns and uh, do uh, machine learning. And, uh, you know, then in physics, you know, again, we, we know the laws very well in, in all, you know, normal situations. You know, we uh, have, uh, you know, we, we, we have the standard model. We have, you know, the many theories, effective theories that it leads to. And so we have very powerful abilities to uh, simulate and uh, get uh, synthetic data that way. You know, the, the properties of the you know, the, the simulation itself are non-trivial, and there's a great deal of uh, structure there that one can look for patterns. So, so, so an example of a mathematical data set would be to make a list of uh, knots. And uh, you know, there's, I guess, an infinite list. Okay, so, so a data set is, you know, you know, if it's infinite, you, you can't, I mean, you, you sort of call it a data set, but you certainly can't give it to a computer. But what you can give in principle to a computer is either a concrete finite list of knots or to be a little bit more general, a probability distribution over knots, right? So, so this is this uh, particular data set which was used by uh, Davies et al. Uh, about uh, two years ago now to uh, predict a new relation, improve the relation between invariance and uh, knot theories. This was all the knots up to 16 crossings and then a set of for each knot Geom well, algebraic invariance. Okay, so these are, you know, have you know, the, the Jones polynomial being a, an example that uh, you know physicists certainly know about. Uh, there's some rule for manipulating. You draw the the knot and you manipulate. You you cross link, you know strands over each other and uh, you can compute this invariance. And uh, then there are geometric invariants. And, and the general story of those is it's not obvious, but if you take a Three sphere, and then excise, you know, cut out the uh, the the knot. You get 
a you know a three manifold with a boundary, but then you can put a natural hyperbolic a, a metric of constant negative curvature on it. You get this uh, natural hyperbolic space of finite volume associated with the knot. And so that volume, you know, if the curvature is minus one, that's as to scale. And uh, then the volume is an invariant. There's many other invariants that you can then, based on that geometry, you can put gauge theory, turn Simon's gauge theory, and find an invariance. And uh, what uh, Davies et al. and uh, Mark Lackenby were able to prove is a bound on the uh, signature, basically, in terms of these geometric invariants. And how did they did this? They did this by data science, basically. They did it by taking this big table and uh, trying for each column of the table, can we fit that column as a function of, of, of the others, say the signature as a function of the geometric invariants. And we'll feed it just to a general neural network and see if we can get a fit. And uh, so there were various candidates, in particular signature dependent on some list of invariants here. And then they used clever attribution analysis to say, well, OK, which of these features really were controlling the fit and which ones were kind of uh, secondary. And this is a paper one can learn quite a bit from in terms of the Again, real data science, but applied to this, uh, what I like to call a platonic data set, you know, some, a data set that it is data, but, uh, you know, somebody often, uh, you know, the Andromeda galaxy would, could construct the same data set, just from the definition of not. Okay, this is, uh, there's uh, something called the LMFDD that, uh, you know, many, some of you will, will know about. Data set, it includes modular forms, it includes elliptic curves. I, I don't again. I don't think I'll go into detail, but this is the background for this uh, first Lynchian Dyer conjecture, which uh, was, in a way, you know, an early example of this machine learning paradigm. It turns out that it's something where you can do it by linear regression. It's a, basically a prediction in terms of the, uh, you know, a particular pro your ratio of products. So if you take log, you can do linear regression. But to, to do it with the computers available in the 50s and 60s is quite a uh, to force. Uh, okay, so here's an example with uh, simulated, you know, physical simulations. And uh, so you know, it's celestial mechanics, okay? So, you know, very, very, you know, classic problem. And uh, one that, uh, you know, quite a bit, you know, you know, simulation sort of answered. In fact, there continues to be progress on this, but, but maybe the you know, in, in some sense, the, uh, you know, the, the answer to this uh, age-old question, you know, is the solar system stable, was more or less uh, found in 2009 by simulations by Gastineau and Lascar. And in general, it's not stable. Okay? And, and what that means, because it's a chaotic system, is that uh, if you wait long enough, eventually you'll eject uh, some planet, or equivalently, if you go for some billions of years, but you slightly vary the initial conditions, about 1% uh, of those will lead to ejecting a planet. And there's actually an interesting relative stability there, because it turns out that the Lyapunov exponent for the inner planets is, is like a few million years. So why it should take billions of years to eject a planet is also non-trivial. But anyways, this is much studied, but then you can, of course, generalize the problem. This has become very interesting to astronomers who discover and study exoplanetary systems. And so you can ask the general question. Suppose I, I say there are, there are n planets. I know their masses. I know their initial conditions. So is it stable? Or if not, what is the expected time scale of uh, instability? And uh, you know, then that's obviously a very intricate problem. And there would be a straightforward way to do machine learning to try to uh, you know, solve it. You do lots and lots of simulations. It's hard, you, know, you do them long enough to see whether you know, the, the system is stable or, or, or observe instability at some time scale t, and then try to predict t from that initial data. And if you do it that way, it doesn't work. And it's kind of obvious that it's not going to work because the system's chaotic, and it really depended on very, very precise details of that initial condition. But the thing that does work is you run the uh, simulation for, for very much less time. So they, they want to predict instability on scale of a billion years, but let's only run it for uh, 10,000 years. But now let's uh, look at the uh, position, the orbital elements, every orbital period, you know, every quote year, and uh, then combine those features. Okay, so now it's exploring the phase space 
and uh, they made various uh, summaries of this statistics is the point where it's not pure machine learning, although a later work did it in a more kind of pure way, but they used uh, known ideas you know, in, in, the, in, in this problem to try to make summary statistics, which then the machine learning program predicted you know, a border between you know, stable on the billion year time scale, unstable. So that's a, a nice example of, of combining again, you know, simulation, which is exact, uh, some physical knowledge about the, the problem, but then really machine learning to do this kind of hard, intricate, uh, actual answer to the, the, the question. Uh, okay, another, I'm, 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 I'm going to just skip, it's, it's just too much for, for one, one good talk, and I can maybe come back to uh, some, some questions. This is a very nice application of uh, graphical neural networks to uh, cosmology from uh, Princeton uh, Flatiron Group that uh, took very large uh, cosmological simulations and uh, was able to, uh, you know, you know they, they, these were expensive supercomputer simulations, but they came up with, uh, you know, relatively simple fits to uh, predict, say, the uh, density of uh, dark matter, to predict uh, corrections to uh, the force, force. I should say the simulations are with, with dark matter, and the goal is to get some sort of simple description, which in a sense integrates out or takes into account the uh, dark matter. And from a technical point of view, what's kind of interesting is the graphical neural network is there to take into account all the pairwise interactions and then just fit the you know, the machine learning fit. And, and then there's this second step of symbolic regression where you can take a general you know, relation, you know, XY, such as the neural network has fit, and then look for a symbolic expression that well fits that uh, numerical relation. And then often that comes out with relatively simple formula that uh, you can you know, then interpret and use. And uh, another example of this was, was a work of, with an uh, e economics colleague at uh, Harvard, There's something called the theory of gravity in economics, OK? And, 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 and what's that? So you look at the, the trade between pairs of countries. And uh, so there's the imports and the exports. And you make a big table. And then you can fit the amount of trade between any pair of countries really pretty well by saying the size or the GDP of the first country times the size of the second country GDP divided by the geographical distance between these uh, countries. And so you see why it's called that. And uh, so uh, you know, by economic standards, you know, this just fits R squared of about 0 0.4, which by economic standards is really pretty good, especially for such a simple model. And uh, so then there's quite a lot of work on this. This was you know, 1960. And in particular, there are models with uh, higher, like you know, three country, multiple country effects. You know, like if one country is very good at making a certain thing, then that will change the, the patterns. And you can take that into account. And we just did it ab initio with a graphical neural network and a symbolic fit. And we got his model as, as, as good as any with some real similarity with these, these, these handcrafted models that had higher order effects in them. So it was another example of this. Uh, I'm just going to make this point very quickly. So uh, this is uh, statistics, you know, very you know, direct concern to this uh, conference. And you know, I, 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 I feel that the rest of mathematics you know, is, 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 is being more and more influenced by statistics in, 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 in many ways. And uh, one example of that is that uh, instead of handcrafting a model, and the, the example I give of that is uh, data analysis at a collider. So this is the Atlas of Detector at LHC, and there are these complicated events with millions, you know, with thousands, you know, of, of jet, you know, particles coming out. And then theory tells you that these come from some <coughs> small event where you have you know, you, you, a small collision, you know, maybe a couple of quirks come out, and then they give rise to jets with hundreds of particles. And you have to identify the jets as the first step of the analysis. And so people developed you know, a variety of ways of doing that. But then a relatively straightforward way that works just as well, if not better, is uh, you imagine this interaction region is surrounded by a cylinder, which it is, the detector. And then you just characterize the event as uh, how much energy was put in each pixel of this uh, cylinder, each little region. And uh, then we can define a distance between events as the uh, Wasserstein distance, you know, the uh, total movement of energy to take one event 
is energy distribution and move it into another energy distribution. You know, so the formula here, which you know, in this audience people know, and then do clustering with respect to that distance. And then that does, it's very similar to one of these handcrafted algorithms, but it's a general technique. And so by general approaches, both because we have, we know so much more, and because our computers are better, and so we can get away with using general approaches. A lot of problems <clears throat> you know, map onto each other, and you don't need all the specifics of, of the, you know, the inventions in each particular field. Uh, probabilistic models and number theory, I mean, that, that, that's an you know, interesting topic. The example I give here is a, it's, it's not machine learning, but it's a probabilistic model. It's a simple model of elliptic curves, and it predicts the distribution, it models, I should say, the distribution of ranks of elliptic curves. This is from uh, 2012, 2013. And uh, you know, one can do various things, but uh, this model in particular strongly suggests, if you believe it, that uh, once you get past a certain rank 21, there should only be a finite number of, of curves of higher ranks. So you know, open, open question, but uh, a larger picture in which one can try to make such statements. OK, so uh, now I'm, I'm going to switch gears and, again, probably try to go fast and tell you something about uh, interactive theorem proving. So this is, uh, if, if, if there were questions you know, specifically about uh, topics there, we can save them for the end. But uh, if there's something, OK, I'll, I'll keep going. OK, so, uh, okay so, so going back now to these, uh, you know, the 50s and the 60s, and this uh, theorem prover, and this led to this concept of uh, automatic theorem proving. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it, it, in principle, it's AI, but it's also just something one could try to program a computer to do. And led to this whole branch of uh, computer science called uh, formal methods, which is you know, quite useful when you have uh, problems, you know, pro software, you know, things that have to be as reliable as possible, you know, like an airplane autopilot. You know. the, the example, you know, in fact, an important example is that the uh, first Pentium processors that Intel made in the uh, mid-90s, uh, they implemented the, uh, at that time, new floating point standard. And uh, they got, made a mistake in a few kind of boundary cases, things that you know, hardly make any difference. And so they kind of said, oh, you know, who will care about that? But people were so distressed, you know, that uh, you know both it was not producing uh, guaranteed correct results, and that uh, you know when you check your software, then you had to worry about this all the time. That they wound up recalling, and it, it cost them more than a billion dollars. And now they verify using the technology I'm about to describe their designs, in particular the floating point unit in, in every uh, chip, you know new chip design, and. Uh, this is an example, it's probably a little hard to read in the back, of how this is used in uh, software development. And uh, so this is the uh, Koch theorem proving language. And this is the definition in this language of what it would mean to be a sorting algorithm. So a sorting algorithm takes a list of some order set, but here we'll say natural numbers, into another list, such that the new list is a permutation of the old list, and the new list is uh, sorted. And then there are pretty straightforward logical definitions of, of all of those concepts. You know, what it means for a list to be sorted, well, the order relations have to be compatible, what it means to be a permutation. There's a nice uh, you know, recursive definition that uh, you can take two permutations and append the same elements in front, append elements in their transposition in front. It's, it's transitive. And then it's a topic taught in you know, courses, your textbook. You know, take a program, you know, something like an intricate quick sort program to sort a list and use a, you know, use the theorem proving language to prove that it really satisfies this relation. Okay, so, so this technology exists and people have used it as well for mathematics and for proof in uh, mathematics and famously examples like uh, the four color theorem I'll get to. But let's again give an example. So the system which is attracting a lot of interest of, and uh, uh, I'll say, say more, is, is the lean theorem proving system. And let me give as an example the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra, you know, that a polynomial of a non-constant polynomial has a, a root. And then this is the statement in this lean theorem proving language of th what I just said. You know, so the polynomial is f. It, we have to give, somehow justify the hypothesis that the degree of f is, is positive. 
And if so, then there exists some complex Z so that if I evaluate F as Z, I get zero. So pretty, pretty straightforward, logically precise claim. And uh, now here I've put up uh, informal, but, but you know, easily made a you know, rigorous uh, proof. And uh, some calculations added to this will make a, a rigorous, you know, a complete proof. And the, 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 the strategy I've described here is you uh, first show that the, the magnitude of F attains its uh, minimum someplace, and then you essentially use a holomorphy to show that, uh, that that minimum really has to be zero. Otherwise, there would be a, you know, a direction that would decrease, and there would be a contradiction. And uh, so this is the uh, lean theorem proving expression of that first step of the proof to show that uh, the function attains its uh, minimum someplace. And uh, so I don't know how much of it people can read, so I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. The line, the second line of this proof is the statement, in, again, in formal terms that I just made. You know, there exists an x such that for some y, polynomial value at y, absolute value is less than or equal than the value at any x. And the rest of it is the proof. And, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to read. So it's, it's a precise enough and clear enough uh, proof that it can be verified. The computer can just say 100%, you know, this is, this is true. The program that does the verification is sufficiently short that it's been checked in, in multiple ways. Uh, it's a combination of logical, you know, com, you know, obviously you know, rules of combination, previously proven lemmas with names like exist for all LE of compact, again, which you would have to look elsewhere. If you were using the system, you would be able to hover your cursor over that and it would explain what that thing meant, which at least helps somewhat. And then there are strewn through this various uh, what are called tactics, so like when it says simp, it's a sufficiently simple you know, simplification of the goal statement is trying to prove that the computer can try to figure that out itself. You know, just you know, cancel like terms, do some sort of simplification. RW is an explicit rewrite. Let's take uh, the consequence of uh, you know, this previously proven lemma and rewrite the goal. You know, if, if the previous consequence was A equals B and I see an A, rewrite it to be a B. So it's somewhere in between computer programming and mathematical proof, but it's more like computer programming. It, it, it shares commonalities with uh, both. And uh, so, so there, this is something one can learn to do with, at present, about a year of practice, okay? And I will refer you to uh, Kevin Buzzard's blog and numerous uh, demonstrations and exercises in the math library. But the, again, it's a potentially a very powerful technology for, you know, any mathematician that wants rigorous results and, uh, you know, would obviously save huge amounts of effort in refereeing and the rest if one could just write this stuff more simply. And uh, so where will that go? Okay, well, one direction it could go, and this was a project of uh, Tom Hales, who actually led a sizable project. This is uh, Tom Hales who proved the uh, Kepler conjecture about packing of uh, balls in uh, three dimensions, would be to say you can take the statements of theorems, like the second line here. Those tend to be not that hard to write. And imagine some sort of a library where people, when you write a paper, you know, just as you have, you know, math, math sign ad, you know, and the, you know, ZB math and so forth, ad systems of abstracts, you could have a formal abstract where you explain a result of your paper in this computer readable term. So that's, that's a possible direction to go. Uh, just as a, an illustration of uh, where, where this is at, the, the group of maybe two or 300 people have learned how to do this and uh, have a uh, Zulip channel that you can look at. And uh, the there's a library with, which more or less has got somewhat past the uh, standard French undergraduate math curriculum. This was, this was outlined by uh, Patrick Masseau at Orsay, and that's why it's the French curriculum. But uh, in any case, it has quite a bit more, but systematically it has pretty much everything at that, at that level. And uh, so uh, these are some examples of formally verified proofs using 
this uh, system, uh, one which attracted quite a bit of attention and was completed, uh, well, it was begun about two years ago. It was what's called the liquid tensor experiment. So uh, Peter Schultz, a uh, you know, famous uh, mathematician, and uh, Dustin Clausen have a uh, program that they call condensed uh, mathematics, which uh, I would have a hard time explaining very clearly what it is. But uh, in some very high level sense, one's taking techniques from number theory techniques that are used, for example, in p-adic analysis. And generalizing the statement to the point where you can use them in the real analysis. And uh, so, so Schultz had come up with a uh, foundational lemma for, for this approach, which uh, he proved. And then his proof was sufficiently intricate that he wasn't satisfied. And he wasn't even 100% convinced it was true. And so he challenged this uh, community of people using this theorem proving system. You know, you, know, you, you can verify theorems. You know, verify my, my proof here. And uh, so they, they took it up. And uh, within something like uh, four months, they were able to verify that part of the uh, proof that he was not convinced by. And so they, they answered his original question. And last summer, they finished it. And so it's completely verified down to you know, the initial definitions, which is in terms of not set theory, but this uh, type theory that it's based on. And, and uh, Schultz uh, not only you know, was, was satisfied about his theorem, but he said he, he learned things by reading this uh, you know, proof, again, that you know, people had written, but to, to get it to work in this uh, com computational framework uh, lean, things had to be rephrased in ways that he, he found uh, illuminating. OK, so, uh, so that's kind of the status of uh, math use of those things. And I refer you to Kevin Buzzard's uh, ICM lecture for 20, 20, you know, last summer for more. Uh, could you use AI? Could you now combine the two themes of this talk? Could you use AI to make this theorem improving something relatively easy to use? Or even you know, someday the computer could start coming up with its own theorems and proving them. And uh, then, well, what, what would it involve? I mean, there's the. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I showed you, I didn't try to explain it, but uh, you know, one of these proofs, it has the actual logical structure of the proof. Each step involves either choosing a premise, you know, some already proven statement from this proof, some already proven statement from the library of millions of things that people already proved, or a tactic selection to say, you know, well, simplify the expression here. You know, use that element that you prove to, to rewrite that equation and so forth. And uh, so you can regard the uh, proof as something, completing the proof as something like a game of solitaire. And if you, you know, sit with the computer doing this, it, it really is kind of like that video game, you know, where you, you try out a tactic and you know, it lights up green if it works. And you know, your list of things that you have to prove suddenly gets shorter you know, or, or not. And uh, so it's kind of like a game of solitaire. And so what does this uh, suggest? Well, obviously, this suggests that uh, you, know, you use the techniques that which work so well to play Go and, and chess and the rest. And uh, that was uh, reinforcement learning. Seems like a long time ago now, 2016. And uh, anyways, uh, this was a approach people tried quite a bit around uh, 2018, when this talk, you know, first started giving this talk, to use the same reinforcement learning system, train on a database of exactly you know, these, these theorems and libraries that, that mathematicians had already proven. And uh, then it, uh, you know, again, it learns how to play this game of solitaire and uh, can get up to proving. You, you, you split long proofs into units of you know, maybe five to 10 lines, and it can prove maybe 75% of them. You know, to be more precise, you take the, the big library of things people have proven and you held some of them out. You train it on part of it. And then the test is how many of the ones that you held out can it prove? And it was 75% last I checked. OK, another project you could try to do. And again, this was kind of a, a, a dream back in 2018, 2019, would be to translate the uh, you know, archive, you know, math papers, you know, into the logical framework, such as Lean, that I described in yeah, that I showed you an example of. And uh, let me skip ahead, because uh, this stuff has accelerated quite a bit, thanks to uh, famous uh, large language models. And uh, you know, I could give a whole talk, and I have. You could look, for example, at uh, 
a talk I gave at the Institute uh, almost a month ago on this, on this topic. But uh, what does a large language model do? You know, you've, you've all read you know, quite a bit about it already, but uh, it's, a, it's a statistical language model, first of all. It predicts, given a sequence of words, it predicts a probability distribution for the next word. And then by iterating that process, these successive conditional probabilities, of course, you get effectively you define the probability distribution over strings of words, over text. And you're just trying to model. You have this big corpus of text, you know, quote all the documents on the uh, internet. And you're just trying to model that probability distribution. And uh, it's an old idea, but in 2017, the discovery the proposal of what's called attention made this really take off, led to this transformer model. And uh, I won't go into the details in this talk, but uh, the idea of attention is that uh, generally we're taking words and representing them by embedding in some high dimensional space. You know, it's like 12,000 12, dimension for GPT-3. And uh, then we might operate on the words through some learned function of a neural network, but of course uh, the meaning of a word depends very much on its context. There are the words around it. And uh, so the transformer provides a, a precise way to combine the embedding of, of the various words. And this is an example of a, a sentence where the interpretation of the word very much depends on what's around it. So the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. Well, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't suffice just to even you know, know the, the, the grammar. You have to know that, uh, you know, to understand the referent of uh, it here, well, an animal can be tired. You know, a street can't be tired. A street can be wide. And uh, then this was uh, GPT-2, I believe, already getting uh, this level of uh, interpretation, understanding what's the right antecedent of that pronoun, it. And uh, so uh, I'll just give a few examples. Of, well, I, I'll, I'll say a little bit about this. Okay, so so this was people started making these uh, language models. You know, 27. You know, again, the transformer language model specifically, 2017, 2018, and uh, then you know again had kind of good enough results to be convinced that this was better than previous. You know, such as recurrent neural networks, but unclear. You know how you know it, you know you know how 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 far can this go? And a, a, a rather important development in the 2020 of uh, Kaplan and al. is this idea that language model performance satisfies simple uh, scaling laws. Okay, so it's, again, kind of an old idea of machine learning, but they had the data to actually look at language models and scaling. And so here I've plotted graphs from their paper that uh, have on the x-axis some measure of the size or the resources, you know, the number of parameters of the model, log scale, or the uh, data set, the training data set size, log scale, and then the uh, loss, you know, basically the uh, perplexity on the uh, y-axis. And uh, so you see these uh, very nice uh, linear, you know, log-log uh, relation. So a power law, which depending on what you're looking at, tends to be around a tenth. And uh, so this, very much encouraged people to think that we just have to scale the model up, make it bigger, and it will do better. And uh, this was important because uh, GPT-3, with uh, especially the big one, has 175 billion parameters, and the first training one took uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to, uh, to run. So, they, you know, it was, so this is why in 2019, OpenAI went to Microsoft and got this uh, billion dollar investment and injection of uh, cloud computing time to be able to pursue this uh, research. And uh, so here's some examples now of uh, GPT-4. You know, again, you, you, especially you know, many people in the audience, I'm sure, have, have played with this, and some of you may be working on these things. This is an example of uh, writing a program. And uh, there are lots and lots of examples of all the simple programs already on the web. So I tried to choose, this is just you know, directly out of GPT-4, an example that uh, probably isn't, wasn't previously there on the web. Write a Python program to compute the first four moments of the sequence of the first 100 prime numbers using the SIVA verisophonies. And uh, so then you get a pretty good program. I, I actually didn't run it yet, but uh, having looked at it, it has the right, all the right ingredients. 
conceivable that it has a mistake or two someplace. But uh, you know, there's the C of Aristophanes. There's the, the first hundred. There's the computation of the moments. And uh, so it's able to put all that uh, together. Uh, this is this auto-formalization that I talked about as uh, can you take a uh, statement in a natural language and uh, turn it into a you know, logical statement, logical proof. And in particular, this is an example of an international mathematical Olympiad problem. This is from Paulo et al. 2022. It's a relatively simple problem for the, for the IML. Prove this inequality at the top, which you, you can prove using you know, algebraic manipulations. And then this was the output of, 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 of their model, you know, trained mostly, you know, pre-trained on the standard, you know, it, it was GPT-3 then subsequently trained some more on uh, formal <coughs> math and the like, GPTF. And uh, at this point, it can solve two out of 20, but uh, more recent work, it can solve something like uh, 12 out of the set of 20 IMO problems. I think GPT-4 can do that. Uh, this is from uh, Lefkowitz et al. This is from middle of last summer. This is the Minerva <coughs> system developed at uh, Google, again, starting with the Google Palm language model and then training it intensively on, on the archive and other uh, you know, math and physics sources. And uh, so you give it the question up there, a line parallel to y equals 4x plus 6 passes through 5 comma 10. What is the y-coordinate at the point where this line crosses the y-axis? And then you know, it produces a correct answer with a correct reasoning. And for this kind of, again, you know, some you know, set of you know, early undergraduate math and physics problems, it can solve 50% of them at this level, and maybe another 20% where it makes kind of you know, little, little mistakes. So, but on the other hand, of course, if, if you've tried to push this, you know very well that uh, at present, these things are quite limited in their ability to, to reason, and it's really not totally clear what this means in some, some bigger scheme of things. So, uh, okay. So, so let me stop there and uh, just try to, to, to summarize and draw some kind of predictions for uh, 2030. Okay, so a uh, prediction which I, even longer version of the talk, spent some time on is uh, that uh, there will be textbooks that really integrate the use of computation much more in ways that help the students. You know, the stu again, it's not that there are many textbooks that use computation and tell you how to compute given the knowledge of subject, but something that brings them together in a way that, that will be an obvious advance over the way we teach now. Uh, you know, this, this, this field of uh, computational mathematics obviously will continue to uh, you know, get better, easier to use. Uh, I, 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 I predict uh, that in, in, in less than five years, this, <clears throat> you know, interactive theorem proving the lean system in particular with uh, the help of uh, AI and perhaps other tools will be relatively easy to use. It'll be sort of comparable to, you know, computer algebra, Mathematica, Maple, and so forth now, where it, you, you can just pick up the book and try it out on your problem and not have to spend a year studying it to do anything. And at that point, it will start to become a much more widespread tool. Uh, I, 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 I think on that same time scale, there will be a translation of more or less the whole archive, not 100% reliable, not with all the proofs, but a, enough of it into formal mathematics to, to have that as a resource for this kind of a research. And in particular, for mathematical search, there'll be semantic mathematical search where you can not just type the name of a theorem or you know, the exact text of what you're looking for, but uh, a definition you know, in, in a much more conceptual way. Or if, you, know, you, know, you could tell it you know, a, 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 a set of you know, equations or, or inequalities, and it would find something which we would say is, 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 is directly relevant to that, even though the text doesn't match at all. And the test of that will be that uh, you, you have your question, and uh, you type it in, and it tells you a result from some very different field of mathematics, which is not obvious as relevant, but indeed turns out to be quite relevant. So that's a test that has not yet been passed. But uh, I, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining within uh, five years at this point. Uh, OK, now finally, we'll 
computers have invented or proven any major result by themselves. You know, so that's, I think, a clearer test than saying some vague question of human level capability. Obviously, that's the age old question. And I made a prediction here also around uh, 2020, which is that uh, this is a slightly nuanced prediction. It's to, it's, it's to say, well, okay, math reasoning is comparable to reasoning in other human domains. It's just not fundamentally easier or harder. It is a kind of reasoning that we do it throughout uh, life you know, in, in many professions. And in fact, math is clearly not the biggest priority because you can make much more money reasoning about uh, other domains. And you can do much more good for humanity, for example, by producing a medical system or a you know, you know, biomedical research system and so forth. And uh, they may have more data. The great advantage of uh, math from many points of view, but in particular from this one, is that uh, you can make an arbitrarily long chain of reasoning with as many steps as you want. And if they're rigorous, then the result will, you know, a sequence of a true deduction will be true. And that's not true in most areas of even science. You know, you eventually, you know, run into the limits of prediction, the limits of real world uh, correspondence with uh, your, your language and so forth. And uh, so if the computer gets a reliable ability to make steps of reasoning, then that's, the, that's what's required to be able to make arbitrarily long chains of reasoning. Obviously, if you can only have 90% reliability, then already 10 steps. You know, typically, one of them will be wrong. But, so you need very, very high reliability here. It exists, of course, because the theorem proving systems, the SAT systems, and so forth that I described are reliable on that scale, but they're not general. They have to program and encode what you're talking about into those systems. But uh, somehow, if the kind of technologies we're talking about here, the language models, could gain that type of a reliability, then that would be the, the breakthrough that would make this possible. And then the prediction I made is that, and, and that breakthrough has not happened yet, clearly, but uh, that 10 years after that, and this may be even pessimistic, we will see computers at the very least uh, human level. And that's by analogy to AlphaGo, where the breakthrough that made that possible was the Monte Carlo tree search, which was introduced and recognized to be quite an advance in 2006. And uh, so perhaps in the coming you know, year, five years, or whatever, the language model, people will make this step with the language models. And then their prediction is that 10 years after that, we will see human level performance in mathematics. So, so let me stop there, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. It was really fascinating. Uh, let me uh, just add a piece of information that I think is even more important now. Uh, Michael is also part of the ICTP advisory board. And, uh, after this talk, I think it's even more clear why your input is so important. So really, thank you. So if there are any questions, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, there are certain claimed proofs in mathematics about which uh, experts disagree. Uh -huh. uh, so I was wondering, uh, how far are we from that stage when AI will settle th uh, this question one way or the other? Okay. And the second question uh, is, uh, to what extent uh, machine learning will help us uh, identify generic features of the string theory landscape? Uh, uh, I'm asking this because you have thought a lot about uh, this particular right, question. Right, right. Okay. Well, I mean, the first one, of course, uh, people could uh, take a given you know, point of dispute, and you could you know, formalize it in the way you talked about here and let the computer, without any AI, you know. And uh, in, 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 in practice, the, the mathematicians really do come to a consensus. So this is, most mathematicians I talk to don't consider this to be like a, a, a high priority to, to develop the technology for that reason. So like, for example, the you know, the uh, Michizuki's uh, ABC conjecture claim proof. Most of the uh, mathematical world does not believe that proof for reasons that were, you know, pointed out by uh, 
Tulsa and others, you know, and so that tends to be where such uh, disputes end up. But it's certainly true if there were a dispute that uh, went on for longer, it, the technology is already there. And then, as I said, I, I believe within five years, right now it would be a, 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 a big pain to take in, you know, real mathematics. Although, again, a, a project one can, one, can, one can work on. Kevin Buzzard, and I, I believe in his ICM lecture, and certainly in others, has proposed working on uh, Fermat and uh, doing much of uh, Lyle's proof formalizing, you know, not, not the whole thing from the foundations, but from more or less the status of like 1990, formalizing the subsequent uh, developments, 1980 maybe. And uh, so, so it is a usable thing, but I, w I, 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 I did predict that within five years it will become you know, very usable. You know, again, the, the, the point of comparison would be like Mathematica. And then, you know, I, I think the, the, unfortunately the string landscape is a harder problem because we don't have a very precise definition. We don't have a foundational definition of string theory. We have uh, all sorts of tools that we kind of bring in in unsystematic ways. And uh, I think, uh, you know, to be honest, there are related problems that, that will, be, will be solved first. You know, like in fact, I, I, I predict that just some sort of broad understanding of the bootstrap and the space of conformal field theories, would, would, that, that is a thing which could come within five, you know, if you're very optimistic, you know, five or 10 years, maybe with computers helping us, because that, that's a much more well-posed problem. And then that certainly bears on the string theory one. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. So I will ask myself a question, if I may. The first one is, um, I find that a very nice and optimistic picture. And uh, what do you think, uh, would things change if we start to put in the, let's say, in the balance, the fact that we're experiencing uh, a lack, a scarcity of raw materials to produce chips, that training these large models have a tremendous uh, environmental and ener energy cost. So how do you think we'll, things will go? Will this increase in the exponential power, this exponential curve right. in the power of right. neural networks, right. Right. will follow this trend if we take that into account? Or? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, obviously the, the exponential cannot go on for very much longer, you know. I mean, it's always it becomes a logistic curve and we can't be that far from the inflection point. And uh, I also don't believe uh, I mean, there's like an extreme interpretation of these scaling curves that I put up to the effect that, uh, you know, you just, uh, you know, keep scaling out and you eventually get some human level or superhuman level of intelligence. And most people don't believe that, and I don't believe that. And on the other hand, there are many proposals out there about uh, what's missing from the current language models and what you should uh, put in. I mean, one reference I can put in, a very concrete thing is uh, Jan Lacan's uh, I, I call it manifesto, but from a year ago, it's easily available online. He has a list of maybe five ingredients which are missing that uh, you, you, people could put in. So I don't think the advances necessarily depend on having exponential growth of uh, the computing power. I think uh, that probably that, that phase will only go for another couple of years, in fact. And there are people, I mean, the thing which we're clearly also running out of is uh, data. So in terms of uh, you know, natural language on the internet, that's pretty much been used, you know. And uh, so it's, you need both, both things for these uh, scaling to hold. You need arbitrary model size and arbitrary data set size. So that's another reason why, you know, techniques and uh, concepts need to advance as well. But they, they do seem to be advancing. Yeah. But so do you think the trend is going towards smaller models or? Uh, yeah, right now. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's a very kind of, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, people certainly have had success, uh, you know, duplicating, you know, what performance of a big model with a smaller model. And we don't understand it well enough to make principled uh, predictions. So, uh, and, and, and uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, of course, that's a, that's a thing which uh, many more people can work on is to, to train a smaller model. That's one reason. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, my, 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 certainly my, 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 if I had to guess, I would guess that you don't need. So, so GPT-4 is claimed to have 1.4 trillion parameters. And uh, 
you don't need that much to get that performance. I would certainly, I, I bet most people would say that, but exactly how you make the model smaller, yeah. Then I'll ask my second question. I'm curious to know, uh, how can we guarantee that, uh, let's say, uh, such languages that you presented, like Lean, or that are uh, giving formal proofs, are actually reliable, especially in cases where maybe the proof is not human readable, or it's right. uh, you, right. you just right. get a yes, right. no answer. How, how right. can we get formal proofs that these right. are? Okay. So. Well, that, 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 that starts to get into much more developed areas of uh, computer science. I mean, I think uh, the first step is to be absolutely convinced that the verifier is, is correct. And, uh, you know, there, there are many ways people do that. I mean, people, you, they're just short enough that, you know, you, you can verify using another verifier even. And there, there, there are examples of, 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 that, of that being done. And again, with enough kind of cross-verification, enough results, because the thing is not that long, you, you can become convinced about the verifier itself. And uh, you know, then making a long run, of course, you can repeat the run many times. And if each run has a small failure probability, then of course, repeating is an effective way to make that probability become arbitrarily small. So I. I, I I mean, I think it becomes more interesting when the, the, you know, the, the use of the formalism is in some way ambiguous or imprecise. And then there's, of course, much more of a question of uh, well, you know, what does it mean? Can you really be sure that this formalism reflects? And that's the, that tends to be the big problem with verifying programs, is that uh, making an accurate specification is just as complicated as writing the program. You know, I mean, it's different, so you still gain something. But it's, you know, that's, that's one reason that uh, the, the verification is not you know, besides the, 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 you know, the skill required to, to, to write the, 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 the proof, there's the skill required in doing the, form, doing the specification. But uh, again, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about how language models are going to change, how we think about all these things. And in fact, the language models may be a far, far greater motivation to make verification into their improving work than we ever had before. Because of course, before we could say, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's your job to make sure it's right. And uh, you, know, if it's, you know, you stare at it long enough and find enough tests until you think it's right. But you can't say that to the language model. But it's still so tempting to, to use it that you would like some way to verify the correctness of what it's putting out. And at least for you know, math and to some extent for programming, one can do that. So I think, I think for that reason, the verification will become a much more interesting topic. Um, yeah, thanks for the great talk. And uh, you were like emphasizing the first, that the first step should be the verifi verifier. I'm wondering like not only in the next seven years, but also like let's say in 20 years or so, like do you think that um, there would always uh, need for a human to check after the verifier, or like, hey, we could t totally trust the uh, language model for this? For well, checking the proof. it's really a little hard to predict. You know, it, it, it is starting to get into this you know, unknown realm of, I mean, again, it may not be super intelligent in the sense that it's doing something no human could do, but super intelligent in the sense that it's doing what would take a human a year, and it's doing that in, you know, 10 seconds, you know. And uh, then, uh, right, what do you say? I mean, uh, I mean, I don't see the obstacle in principle to having a combination of language model and verifier and perhaps you know, related, but you know, not some sort of magical you know, technologies we already have that is so reliable that people would just trust it. I don't, I don't think there's any in principle obstacle to that. When that will happen, I, I would certainly expect it within 20 years, and it could be five to 10, I don't know. Um, my question is going a bit in the same direction, and it's coming more from my rel relatives and, and um, neighbors. Yeah. So do you think that we need to teach our kids math and programming or coding in the next, let's say, in 20 years right. going onwards during this kind of development? Right. Yeah, I, I, I do, but for the same reason that we used to teach you know, all the kids math, you know, and uh, even if uh, most people don't wind up using the math in their profession or their everyday life, it's still a 
very, it's a great way to learn to think, you know, it brings a different perspective on many aspects of life than, you know, I mean, you know, literary art, you know, there are many, many perspectives and one should learn, you know, a variety, obviously, you know, but math is definitely one of them, I think, that should be the foundation of education. Now, whether you should count on getting a high salary as a programmer in 10 years, uh, probably there'll be people you know, people who do, but many fewer of them than now, yeah. Yeah. Is there a last question? If not, let's thank again Michael for this. <laughs>